everyone. I am Dr. Jennifer Jones and welcome to Medical Mondays with Dr. O. Today on Medical Mondays, we will continue our conversation. And today's topic is what about male and female infertility? Thank you for joining Dr. Toyin Opisami, MD and American Academy of HIV Medicine Specialist for an exciting conversation about our health. Medical Mondays introduces health information, medical facts, and possible solutions as we examine health challenges to enable each one of us to live our best life. Whether providing high quality medical care for families and individuals through Genesaret Medical Center, providing care for vulnerable communities through Global Vision Health Center, or providing medical missions in the US and abroad, Dr. Opisami is committed to changing lives through healthcare. Wherever she goes, one person, one family, and one community at a time. Welcome to tonight's opportunity to explore healthcare with one of our nation's leading community health advocates and world-renowned medical missions expert. Welcome to Medical Mondays with Dr. O. Dr. O, good evening. Good evening. Thank you, sis. Dr. Jennifer Jones, I praise the Lord for you. I thank you all for being here tonight for an exciting conversation. Welcome. Tonight, we are so excited to have with us tonight as our guest, Dr. Yemi Famu Yahweh. Dr. Femi Famu Yahweh is a, an exceptional fellow of the American Congress of Obstetrics and Gynecology. She is a board certified infertility specialist and is an absolutely top of the line, world-class endocrinologist. Tonight, she will be speaking to us about reproductive health and talking to us about male and female infertility. I am so excited about tonight's show and let's get our show started. Remember to all of our guests, if you have questions throughout tonight's presentation, please just drop them in the chat box or raise your hands. And after Dr. O and Dr. Femi Yahweh present to you all that they have to say about male and female infertility, we're going to light up the evening with questions, answers, and discussions. Dr. O, you have the floor. Thank you again. Dr. Yemi Famuiwa. What can I say about her? Amazing woman who has a passion for what she does, who chose the line to bless people with fertility. I like to say it's fertility because that's what she does. Turns infertility to fertility. So that's why tonight, whether you are in your reproductive years or outside that frame, you will learn a lot of caveats, caveats that would help other people that you meet that may be experiencing fertility issues. For whatever reason, we've seen a lot of infertility in our generations now. And this is a subject that is so important to talk about. I know her personally, and she is the best of the best. We are so blessed at Medical Mondays to have Dr. Yemi Famuiwa here. I'll give you the floor. Thank you so much, Dr. Opresami. Thank you, Dr. Jones. I am deeply honored to be invited to your forum. And I wanna thank everyone to that is here tonight. We know you could be enjoying dinner. So um, in order to respect your time, I'm going to dive right in. And what I'd like to do is just give you a little vignette, a little overview. It's not going to be extensive. And then I'm going to invite questions because that's where we'll really get into the nitty gritty. Um, so which, uh, without further ado, I'm going to start off by sharing my screen. I hope everyone can see this. Is this visible to everybody? Okay, so I like to read extensively, both in the medical literature, for leisure, for things that captivate my interest. 
And one of the books I was reading recently was uh, Dr. Gupta's book called Keep Sharp, um, where he talks about how you can live your life and your choices you make help to actually repair your brain, add more brain cells, and maybe slow down or reverse de dementia. Now that truly captivated me because I found out his advice actually mirrors what we in fertility tell patients. Basically, the whole point of it is the environment in which your body is, your eggs, your sperm, that environment, the whole makeup of it is going to affect the quality of the eggs or the sperm. Now, if it helps you have a sharper brain, that's fantastic, okay? So how, what, what does that mean? Well, we know that if you have a lot of inflammation in your body, inflammation caused by disease um, or caused by lifestyle or caused by overconsumption of sugar, um, high blood pressure, whatever it is, the egg quality and the sperm quality starts to suffer for it, right? So um, again, this just shows you his little book. So what do you do to improve the environment of your eggs or your sperm. Simply put, it is paying attention to what goes into your body. Paying attention to what you put in your body and what you do with your body. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is exercise. Now, people don't know this, but exercise is fantastic. Let me give you an idea. If you are stuck with a problem, you're trying to figure out a, a deep solution to something. You can't quite figure out that calculus problem or something is bothering you. Try going for a long walk. Try going for a run. All of a sudden, you start to say, hey, wait a minute. I'm thinking of ideas that I never thought before. Well, that's because exercise reduces inflammation, reduces stress. And guess what? That helps your fertility as well. So how does that impact fertility? We know that lack of exercise, elevated blood glucose, which can also be um, amenable to exercise, can lead to something called polycystic ovary syndrome. You have an imbalance of your hormone. It causes you to have increased abdominal obesity. We know that the fat around your abdomen is actually the bad fat, because that's the fat that predisposes you to high blood pressure incidentally predisposes you to dementia if you read his book, but guess what? It also affects your eggs and predisposes you to a very common uh, syndrome called polycystic ovary syndrome, where people get irregular menstrual cycles. So they cannot ovulate when they want to, and they have difficulty getting pregnant. And that's when they see someone like me. I usually have some simple regimens that you can try. You do not have to be an Olympic champion. Do something, do something, go for a walk. I even give my patients a prescription, go to the park, go sit on the, you know, the butterfly garden or something. But I find it easier for my busy schedule to do just a series of floor exercises, 10 to 20 minutes in the morning. It doesn't have to be draconian. And on the weekend, if you want, go for a longer walk. Uh, by the way, I like floor exercises because I hate the cold. I don't want to go out in the cold weather. Stretching is also good for your muscles, decreases inflammation. Now, the, here's something that most people don't realize. When you cheat your body of sleep, you are doing havoc to not only your brain, but you're doing havoc to your eggs and to your, to your um, to, not only to your eggs, you're, you're doing havoc to your, to your brain. So good sleep is, is, is very good for you. Um, nutrition, what kind of food should you be eating? We should pay attention to the kinds of food um, that promotes a lot of vegetables, um, fruits, different colored vegetables give you different nutrients. So those are uh, very good and increase your fertility. Um, and then just a few tidbits on um, what sort of nutrients should you be eating? Things like omega-3 fatty acids, decreasing omega-6 fatty acids. Those are the bad fat. Um, you can look at things, what kind of oils can you use? Um, your 
olive oil, canola oil um, is good for you. So quick summary, what's good for your brain is good for your gametes, being your eggs and your sperm. So I will hand over to Dr. Jones and we can take any questions you want. Thank you so much. What an awesome presentation to talk to us about our fertility health and about our well being. If you can stop sharing your screen now. Oh, sure. And I want to open the floor to Dr. Opisami, to Dr. O. I know you have comments after this amazing presentation. Amazing indeed. Short and straight to the point. We got the gist. We've talked about sleep on this forum. Don't you see how sleep affects everything? We've talked about exercise. That affects everything too. So we have not talked about things like omega-3 or omega-6 fatty acids. You know, I want to throw this out. If you look at fish, fishes, and you're asked, which fish has or does not have omega-3 omega fatty acid? I bet a lot of us will just keep guessing. Tilapia has omega-6 and not omega-3 fatty acid. And a lot of us eat tilapia. It's actually not the fish that should be the fish of our choice. So thank you so much for that wealth of education in such a short period of time. And um, I guess I would like to ask the first question, if it's okay. Absolutely. <laughs> so when we talk about infertility, especially in our culture, African-American culture, we talk about women. It's always the women's problem. Is that right, Dr. Famuiwa? Absolutely not. <laughs> it is a joint issue. That's another thing that I always, it's one of my pet peeves. Fertility is a team effort. It is not a woman's problem alone. It is a joint effort. You cannot try to overcome fertility by just focusing on one partner, focusing on just the woman or just the, the husband. It involves both. It is a team effort to try to overcome fertility. So that's the way I, when I see patients, I tell them we will approach this as a team effort. We can overcome this as a team effort. And I find that if we include both partners and their uh, physician, we get the highest success when we approach it as a team effort. 30% of fertility is actually related to the males. That's what a lot of people don't understand. A good two thirds is a combination of male factor as well as female factor. So it's not just the, the woman alone. Excellent. Dr. O, do you have another question? Yes. So I see that uh, there are lots of people on this forum now, and um, it seems like people are shy <laughs> to ask this fertility question. However, what is the issue these days that people even in their 30s are having difficulty conceiving? Part of the problem is really age. Age is the factor. So now one of the things that we are sharing with a lot of our patients is we know that people pursue their career. Um, so they may pursue career a lot of people don't really know that they should start early. Um, one of the big things I now push for patients is, if you are not ready to get pregnant, freeze your eggs. Age is intimately related to fertility. The older you are, the older the eggs, the more difficult it is 
to fertilize the eggs. So if in doubt, freeze your eggs. Incidentally, most people don't realize it, the sperm quality also decreases with age. So just as now we are telling our younger professional women in their 30s to go freeze their eggs while they're still doing other things, perhaps the gentlemen may need to actually conserve their sperm because we know now that for men over the age of 60, you get a high incidence of birth abnormalities, you get a high incidence of, um, um, I would probably say, um, birth defects and genetic abnormalities in the embryo, in the babies that are resulting from this. So it's probably a good idea, if you can't start early, suspend your fertility. That's the way I look at it. Freeze your fertility for when you're really ready and then there's no pressure. That was excellent. Uh, Dr. O, do you have any more questions before we begin to ask all of our questions? Yes, please. Okay. Some people say, when you do stuff like that, you are actually interfering with God's handiwork. Why don't you let God do his will? Why are you freezing eggs and you know, just manipulating things instead of allowing God? I, you know, that's a very crucial question. There's a fine line and there's a whole different field of ethics. How far is too far? I don't subscribe to um, taking things too far, um, but certainly freezing your eggs for your own use, I don't think is an ethical problem. Now, there are a lot of women who are very intelligent, who are smart, who are in their thirties, but there's no, they're not in a good relationship or they're the right person has not come along. So those women, sometimes feel pressured to go into wrong relationships for the wrong reasons, thinking, oh, yeah, I just need to get pregnant. I just need to have my child. Well, the well-being of the child is important too. So if Mr. Wright's going to come along when you're 40 or 45, the, your child de deserves that relationship as well. So freezing your eggs for your own use at a later date is not necessarily um, what I would consider a bad ethical choice. It might be a smart ethical choice because you meet people at different points in time without the pressure of having to say, okay, I need to force this relationship. I need to do this. It's giving yourself time to think, to respect yourself and, and prepare. Thank you. Uh, I see Dr. Akitonde has his hands raised for a while, for a while now. Thank you very much, Dr. O. I thank you, Dr. Famuiwa. Yes, sir. My, my question is almost um, related to Dr. O's question. Yes. And the question is, what role does positioning play in pregnancy? For example, does missionary always work? I got you. I understand. Because, understand. okay. Okay, okay. Zero, zip, zilch, none. You see, sperm. Uh, you've got to have, explain that. What's the yes. Sperm, when there's an ejaculation, it's the ejaculate is propelled by contractile tissues within the prostate gland. So there's a force of the ejaculation coming out. That's number one. Number two, the sperm itself, a mature sperm has a tail that requires energy, proper nutrition, adequate zinc, so be, you know, vitamins. So if you have good motility and there is an ejaculation, and believe me, they actually did studies on this to see how soon after an ejaculation do you see sperm within the perineal cavity? How soon does sperm um, get into the uterus, get out the tube, exit the tube, literally almost like seconds, because they can swim 
in a very rapid fashion through the cervical mucus, right up the uterus, right into the fallopian tube. So is the, if there's ejaculation that's adequate, that's not an issue. And um, so trying to um, get up, do this, do that, I think all that only stresses, stresses the couple. Remember, you want to decrease stress. Thank you so much. Do you have any follow-up questions, Jimmy? You're on mute. Please unmute yourself. Thank you. My follow-up question, Dr. Famuywa, is as we as you mentioned rightly that with age, sperm quality decreases. Correct. Um, what is your recommendation? Is it diet or supplement to improve the quality as one ages, especially, well, the, especially the men? Um, I, honestly, to tell you the truth, you might want to consider freezing your sperm before you hit age 60 and above. But if in the absence of that, yes, proper nutrition can help. We know that, for instance, the, the, the motility of, your, of the tail of the sperm is tied to, tied to having adequate zinc. So um, proper diet, um, if you eat nutritious food, you supplement your body with vitamins in their native state, not in the processed state that may not necessarily be for your body. I hope that answers your question. Thank, Thank you, you, doctor. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, very you much. so much. I'm going to answer a couple of questions in the chat, and then I'll come back to those who have their hands raised. Um, someone asked at the top of the meeting, if you could, um, Dr. Femi Yuwa, tell us the exact title of the book from Dr. Gupta that, Gupta that you referenced. The title is Keep Sharp. Let me show you the book one more time. Hold on a second. Okay. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yes, this book, Keep Sharp. It's a fantastic read. I actually have two versions of it. You can read it on Audible. I love to read on Audible because I can keep reading in traffic. I can read when I'm cooking, doing whatever. I read on my way up the elevator. I read going into the car. I might walk. I'm one of those people that probably fall off the bridge. <laughs> I love to read and Audible is an excellent way. But if you also get the Kindle version of the paper version, he puts some charts in there as well that may be useful. So I actually have both because I like the book so much. So I reference both his charts and I like to listen to it. Um, again, it's something you can read mm, probably in a couple of days. It's not that much. Wonderful. Thank you so much. The next question is, can you please address the issue of hyposermia or in, in infertility? Okay. Hi, you mean oligospermia as in decreased sperm count? So the way they have spelled it is H-Y-P-O, hypo, and S-E-R-M-I-A, hypothermia. I think they mean uh, olig oligospermia. They probably referring to oligospermia. Oligospermia yeah. is the um, uh, decreased quantity of sperm. Every, um, the WHO sets the standards for semen analysis. And according to the WHO standard that we now use, um, less than 15 million sperm per ml would be considered low. Um, and just a little tie in, Dr. O and I were talking, we're going to do a series of, um, of this session just to tackle male fertility, just a little heads up, because if we start, one hour is not enough. So oligospermia is the decreased quantity of sperm. There are so many reasons why that can happen. It could be from disease, genetic defects, diet, lifestyle, uh, but a lot of things that we will explore in detail when we start our series. I, I hope that gives you a little teaser about um, um, what we're going to do. Absolutely. Another question was, is it easier to investigate males in cases of infertility? And so it's, is it usual to start there? Okay, so I start with both. You can't do one without the other. I'd like to see my patients as a couple, a team. We start with both. 
you, you can't have the yin without the yang. So it's start with both. A lot of times, actually, I've had husbands drag their wives in here. <laughs> and, and typically some of the women, they drag their husbands. I've had husbands drag their wives in here, but you can't do a proper evaluation without starting with both. You need both. Okay. Thank you so much. Now, um, Dr. Adi Mola. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for uh, the wonderful presentation. Um, the simple question is actually is tied together. First is um, in the southern part of Nigeria, there's something that is called preferred sex or gender of the child. And my second question goes to if it happens to be that your answer is going to be that the man determines the sex, what else could a man do? When it's time to, uh, when it comes to sex selection, gender selection. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to ask you to clarify that. I'm not sure I understand what you mean by that. I mean, you're saying in terms of trying to figure out which chromosome enters the eggs, or mm, could you well, that? that would be more clinical. But I would rather say say it as male, female. When I say gender. Uh, if if, if a, a couple prefers to have a male child, for example, what what efforts are needed that you consider to be extra efforts? Well, I mean, I don't know that there's anything out there that's going to properly select um, a sperm or X or Y chromosome. The only way you know the genes is actually if you do a DNA testing, and that gets into a whole different uh, kettle of worms. Uh, but you know, I know that people out there say, well. If you eat this, I mean, I, I know a friend personally that said he, um, he, I wouldn't do it, but he ate a raw egg every morning. And um, I've heard different versions of that. None of that is true. Thank you so much. Another question was, when it comes to freezing eggs, how long can eggs be frozen and is the length of time they're frozen, um, give, does it compromise their effectiveness or their vi viability? Correct. Okay, so when we say egg freezing, the egg is actually a very big cell. Um, it's, so egg freezing in the old days is when you slowly drop the temperature and you try to freeze as in the traditional sense. The problem with that technique is because the egg is a big cell, the water, which is the majority of what your cell is composed of, would crystallize inside the egg. And when it crystallizes and forms ice, it actually just lacerates it. It's like putting ground glass in it. So that was not a good technique for years. But now, nowadays, the technique has shifted, and it's been several years now, where what you do is finally, you, you first dehydrate the cell and then plunge the temperature down. It's called vitrification. That technique has been worked out. All the quirks have been worked out, very stable. And then you keep the egg in liquid nitrogen. The egg can stay indefinitely. That is wonderful. Um, we have another raised hand, Madam Laura. Auntie, I'm asking her to unmute. Yeah, I'm just trying to do it as well. There we go. I need three minutes, ma'am. I'll come right back in. I'll raise my hands back up three minutes. Okay, sure thing. So we Thank do you. have other questions. And um, Dr. Femi, you are, I am so impressed by three things that you've said to us so far. I loved your correlation between the brain and the sperm and the egg, that if you do what's healthy for the brain, sleeping, exercising, eating nutritious foods, eating foods rich in omega-3 fatty acids, like Dr. O highlighted in fish like salmon, uh, that's one of my favorite sources. We eat a lot of salmon in my house. And, and all of the things that you can do nutrition-wise, I think that is such a significant plus and another that you've spoken about is that you can freeze both the egg and the sperm, and you call this suspended fertility, not you don't focus on the freezing, but on the suspension of fertility for the better time in life. What I want to ask is about 
um, something that's piggybacking on Dr. Opisami's question. When you look at the timeline, right, of, um, of, of reproductive age, especially when we think about it in women going through puberty, yes. both boys and girls, yes. we knew that 20 years ago and 30 years ago, girls were going through puberty, um, usually around the 14 to 16 age. And then in the recent years, we've heard that girls are starting puberty as young as eight and at 10 years old. And many people have um, given it to the hormones that are in the foods that they're eating from fast foods. Others are saying that culture sped up. What is you as an expert? What do you say? Well, there is a trend a little lower and maybe sometimes in, in um, girls of, of color, um, however, um, that doesn't have to be. If, if you notice uh, premature sprouting of breast buds or premature um, um, uh, menarche coming on, you can actually halt that. Why is that important? If your daughters or sons go into menarche at a too early age, their bone plates will seal. So they will not be able to achieve their full height potential. So I think that's something that parents can keep an eye out for. And, and it's something that's so treatable nowadays. It's when you ignore it that it's not treatable. And then you end up with a child that's shorter than they, than they should be biologically based on, on the parent's um, 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 height. So yes, that's seen more and more. Um, I, I'm concerned with the amount of of you know nutrition that's put in, in in cattle, for instance. So if you have young children, and this is what I did for my kids when they were younger, just use organic milk if you have to give them milk, um, minus the uh, whatever vitamin or uh, antibiotics or whatever growth hormone they gave the the cattle. Um, just just use organic. That's wonderful, and um, I want to also have you state what should parents be asking and looking for in puberty with regard to what's the question they should ask their clinician? So pay attention to things like early breast buds. And you'd be surprised that it may actually be the grandmothers that notice this first because mom may not pick it up early enough, but the grandmothers will go, hmm, are you paying attention over here? Pay attention. When you go for your annual visits with your pediatrician, talk to them, engage them. You know, they give you a growth chart, they give you a curve, and they tell you where your child should be on that chart. And then ask, is my child being appropriate? If you think it's fast, they do a simple test. They can send you for a simple test called a bone age that tells you if this child is going through a growth spurt, that may be inappropriate. And if that's the case, you can halt it. You can actually treat this. It does not have to be ignored. Wonderful. So I am one of the patients who has been with my OBGYN very early. I have endometriosis uh, with my second pregnancy. I had a stomach full of fibroids and I do get routine ovarian cysts, but they're, I won't even say they're polycystic, but I've had multiple ovarian cysts to the point where, you know, I get them checked out. I watch vigilantly, but someone asked a question in the chat that I think is important. You highlighted it earlier, and this is a follow-on question, to please discuss uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome and how it affects the ability to conceive with irregular and non-existent periods how to increase progesterone in order to ovulate regularly and, and, and what should be prescribed is prescribing birth control um, to normalize and conceive, normalize the period and enable conception recommended. What are your thoughts about? Oh, that? dear Lord. I have to untangle that. Right? Yes. <laughs> that, that is too many things conflated into one and misleading. Yes. First off, let me just give you a quick, before I go into PCO about endometriosis. Endometriosis is when you have menstrual. Sorry to interrupt, Dr. Jennifer, I'm back when you get a minute to. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Okay. So, endometriosis is when you, whatever I, I tell my patients, imagine what should flow out of your body when you have menses flowing back the other way. It causes inflammation, irritation. Your body attacks it, 
and your body's response to that releases inflammatory um, cytokines and enzymes that go like Pac-Man trying to chew it up. In the process, they destroy normal tissue, destroy your eggs. So if you have endometriosis, actually, it might not be a bad idea to freeze your eggs while you still have them before the endometriosis gets worse. Now, let's segue back into polycystic ovary syndrome. Um, that question right there lets me know that the, the person is confusing certain critical issues. The problem with polycystic ovary syndrome is you have normal eggs. Your eggs grow through a growth phase constantly. Every woman is born with a fixed number of eggs. When you come straight out of your mother's womb, the highest amount of eggs that you will have is when you're actually about five months in your mother's womb. By the time you're delivered, that almost 20 million eggs is down to about 200,000. So what happened? The eggs go through a process where we call it apoptosis, uh, a gradual decline. They grow through a phase, they grow up and, and, and die off. It's called gonadotropin independent growth. That is constantly happening. Now, the eggs that are ovulated when you, when you start menarche are the ones that can reach the peak of that curve of, of the continuous wave of activity of the, of the eggs in the ovary. When they get to about eight or nine, that is when they can now become responsive to being stimulated by the brain. The brain sends a signal called FSH to the ovary, which now stimulates the appropriate follicles. The eggs are located in the follicles and they cause the follicle to grow. As the follicle grows, it sends feedback to the brain by producing estradiol. So the brain knows when you are ready to ovulate or release an egg when that follicle is big enough. And it sends out luteinizing hormone to cause ovulation, all right? Now, that is what is going on in the ovary. It's not what is happening in the uterus. When you are producing estradiol, during that growth phase of the eggs, the estradiol can also go to by the bloodstream to the uterus and makes the lining of the uterus get thick. When the egg comes out of the ovary, the follicle does not make as much estradiol. It makes now predominantly progesterone. So progesterone stops the growth of the lining and holds it. But if that egg is not fertilized, that corpus luteum from where the egg came dies off. When it dies off, it stops making progesterone and lack of progesterone, it's like, think of it as progesterone is the scaffolding that holds the cement around the building that you're building. When you rip that scaffolding off, the building comes down, you shed your lining, you have a period. So it's, it's you know, so you can't just say, oh, how do I give progesterone? No, you're not really fixing the issue. With polycystic ovary syndrome, what happens is that normal progression of the eggs being picked up by the brain is blocked. So you get follicles get up to about eight, nine, 10 millimeters in size, and then they're blocked. And then the next batch gets to that size, and then they're blocked. So when you actually look at the ovary, you can actually see all these small follicles that are blocked. Hence the name polycystic ovary syndrome. Now the syndrome is not necessarily just by the eggs being blocked. The question is what is causing the block? The blockage can be due to excessive male hormones called androgens, either produced in the ovary or in the adrenal glands, right? So you need to figure out what's causing it. If you have an abnormal thyroid panel, that can also block that process. If you have elevated prolactin from your pituitary gland, that can cause it. If you have insulin resistance, which we've talked about, extra insulin can directly block the development of eggs in the ovary as well. So when I see a patient who is happy, so let, before we go to treatment, when you block the eggs, you can't ovulate. So what happens is the eggs are still, you know, producing a little bit of estrogen. They're not making a lot individually, but collectively they start to pump out enough estrogen. Guess what happens in the uterus? The lining starts to thicken up. Now, since you don't ovulate, there is no progesterone to stop this growth. 
So you have irregular growth. Eventually, either one follicle escapes, ovulate, you make progesterone, you shed, or the lining can get so heavy by itself that in about two, three months, you just release the lining as a flood of blood. And people say, wow, you know, I just, you know, pumped out blood like no man's business. Or it could, it could be blocked early in, on in the system where there's not enough estrogen, so not enough lining. And that person could go almost a year with no menstrual cycle. So the bleeding is a reflection of what is happening in the ovary. Now, the first thing I do when I see a PCO patient, figure out the, all the hormones that could be causing the blockage. Second thing is, do not overlook the lining because if they have excessive lining development, there's a risk, there's a very high risk of getting endometrial cancer. So, and I've had several PCO patients where I've diagnosed them with, with hyperplasia, which is the precancerous stage. And I tell them, this has to be treated first before we get you pregnant, okay? So then you look at what else is going on with their adrenals? What else is going on with their insulin? Do they have diabetes? A good portion of these patients will give you a family history of diabetes. They're also at risk for diabetes as well. So you see there's a whole factorial thing that you look at. Now, birth control pill is what you use to thin the lining to halt, you, you, you can lower the androgen levels that could be causing the pro problem. You will not get pregnant on birth control pill, however. It's a good way to treat it and keep it in stasis. Now, if when, when a patient comes to me and they want to get pregnant, the first thing we do is find a way to lower whatever is blocking the egg progression. Then find a way to make sure we can shove a couple of eggs over, right? But we don't want all the eggs because they're blocked, they're ready, they're primed, they're ready to go. You don't want you know, a gazillion eggs flying over the, the, the fence. So you wanna control how many eggs are released and you wanna lower the blockage so they actually respond to the treatment you give them. Thank you so much, Dr. Yimi. We are going to continue to answer questions after our conclusion to today's Medical Monday. I want to welcome Dr. O to the mic to share with us her Medical Mondays moment. I praise God for another Medical Monday. Thank you so much. This has been an invigorating um, conversation, um, conversation that includes both male and female. When we talk about fertility, you know, um, like I said earlier, most people think about females only, but it's not even just about fertility. This is about health, no matter what stage you are in life. And would anyone have guessed that we were going to go back to children, your children, to know when menarche, that means when a child starts menstruating, um, to go back as far as that age to make sure that a child is growing properly. Um, there's so much we have learned already, and there's so much we're still going to learn. Um, next week, we're going to go back to routine health maintenance. And we're going to talk about the eyes. Our eyes are very important. Look at all of us in glasses. I am waiting for solution <laughs> to see, you know, um, which way I need to go with this. You know, I'm not going to let too much out of the bag. But till next week, you know, we will, we will um, find out more about that. But tonight, we will carry on conversation about fertility. And for now, I'm gonna hand it over to um, my sister, my friend, Dr. Jennifer Jones. What a wonderful conversation and message from you, Dr. O, and from you, Dr. Fami Yuwa. What a wonderful host of questions that we'll continue in the after hours. But before we conclude today's Medical Mondays, I want to be sure that each one of you remember strong health gives us a strong future. Our next show will be aired on Monday, 
May 10th at 7 o'clock p.m. This has been your Medical Mondays family, our Medical Mondays mission. Thank you all for joining tonight's show, and we look forward to engaging you soon. Have a blessed week, everybody. Thank you. So thank you to all of our Medical Mondays family. We wanted to share with you some exciting news. Don't go anywhere. Those of you who have questions, we are still going to continue our show. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, for me. Um, yeah, Fami Awa, I'm so excited I can barely speak. So <laughs> let me share the great excitement with you. We started Medical Mondays from a conversation on our flight back from Paris. Dr. O and I talked the whole way. We had almost two weeks of turning off our cell phones. We only had Facebook and WhatsApp. And as a consequence, it gave us time to think and rest and de-stress. And out of it came all of this creativity. Medical Monday is on a Monday because I asked Dr. O, what is the best time for us to do a Facebook Live or live stream or something for Medical Mondays? And so she said, oh, Jennifer, Mondays, I think, are a good day because once the week gets going, my patients come first. So that's how we chose Medical Mondays. We were all laughing, Dr. Caprice and Dr. O and I, just last night saying, my goodness, if she had said Wednesdays was her best day, we might be having Wisdom Wednesdays. If she had said Friday was her best day, we might have been saying something else. But she said Mondays, and it just worked. Medical Mondays, Dr. O was born in the thought in mind long before it became reality. And in January, we started talking about having the show. And here we are, fast forward to today, and we are moving forward. So what I want to do is share with you the exciting news of what's happening and why today's show and show format was a little different than it's been for the last eight weeks. We are starting video production for Medical Mondays to get Medical Mondays to go from being the beautiful, wonderful, amazing show that was birthed into getting it up on the YouTube channel so that we can begin marketing, promoting, and pushing our mission forward to make Medical Mondays a household name. Each one of you that have started this journey with us will continue to be a part of the journey. We're still going to do Zoom. We're still going to be live. We're still going to have amazing guests on our show like Dr. Femi Yuwa is today. We will continue to have questions and answers, but we're going to do a 45 minute show first then we're gonna take a quick break and continue with our show. So when you hear us sounding like we're wrapping up the show for the night, we are not, no way. We still have VIPs and champions to celebrate. We still have prizes to give away and we're still gonna have so much interaction just like we planned. So thank you to all of you. Dr. O, would you like to add any other things to this new phase of Medical Mondays? I am just excited. You should have been there yesterday, but Jennifer just said, you know, all she said, this was her idea. When she talked about this and said, we're going to be, look, you, we, have to, we have to bring you on. It's, um, it's gonna be on Facebook. I said, look, Jennifer, I have Facebook. Why don't even know how to use it? And she said, I'll teach you, I'll teach you. Don't worry about it, we'll get it done. This was before COVID. We didn't know that Zoom was going to now be a thing. You know, it was Facebook we had. And I just thank God for her ingenuity, for her creativity, um, for all she does. And for my sister Caprice Ayati, Dr. Ayati, um, it's, been, it's been a journey, but a beautiful one, a non-stressful one. Where, you know, she told me on a Saturday, we were meeting on Saturday and she said, your first day will be on Monday. And I said, what Monday? She said, March 1st in two days. I'm like 48 hours. She said, yes, just be ready. Just sit down and let's chat. I'm like, and March 1st, we started Medical Mondays and I have learned so much. My schedule has changed. I have a bedtime. I've not been always um, great 
with it. But for the most part, I actually have a bedtime. That I go to bed, I stop going to bed at 2, 3 a.m. in the morning just because of things that we learned here on Medical Mondays. Um, I praise God for what he's doing because this is all God. We can share stories with you behind closed doors. I think that won't be tonight. That'll be another day because we have lots of questions, lots of hands raised. Yes. We can share stories with you of things that had happened and God still pull it off. So it is all God. And to God be all the glory. All the glory, all the glory. So thank you so much to everyone. Let's get back into Medical Mondays. Madam Laura, are you still here? We want to make sure you ask your questions before Bible study. <laughs> I don't see her. She's still on, Madam Laura. Please just call us when you get. <laughs> okay, here oh, you wait go. Wait a minute, I can't. Yes, I can't thank you. You, you. you know my routine. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Wonderful show. Wonderful host. Wonderful guest. Wonder. I mean, it's incredible. And I echo your your acknowledgement that it is all God, and to God be all the glory. Mm -hmm. My question is about the. I mean, something alarming that Dr. Famuyiwa said that people should freeze their eggs, especially when they're aging over 30 and there is no life mate in sight it sounds realistic but also scary but that's probably going to be like 30 percent of our children they're not ready <laughs> so now but then she said you can keep it till you're 40 or 45 is there a threshold when it becomes um less dangerous for a woman to to be pregnant or to start carrying a baby? Well, I think it, it depends on where you are. You know, if you're in India, I guess you can have pregnancy when you're at 70, as they've done. But in the US here, it's recommended that you try not to go above the age of 52. You see, pregnancy is also taxing on the body. So you want to, um, you probably I would say a good um, cutoff will be around age 52. Um, I, I would like to chip in there too. The freezing of the eggs as early as possible is important because say your life partner now shows up when you're 45 Correct. and you're now having difficulty getting pregnant. The issue is this, at 45 is like a kiss of death. Am I right, Dr. Famuiwa? You your eggs will not be used anymore. You will now need a surrogate egg, meaning somebody, sure. another woman's egg that has been in the bank, and then they'll give you the pictures and um, you know lifestyle of these people, their educational level and all of that, and then you get to pick an egg that your husband's sperm can now fertilize and then you carry the baby. But if you are frozen your eggs earlier on, you exactly. won't have that issue. Exactly. So exactly. that is important to know. And those eggs, as Dr. Famuiwa said earlier, can be frozen for how long again? Indefinitely. 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 So there's no harm in freezing them because you don't know when you may need them. I, I have, you know, uh, one of my nieces who, the partner didn't come yet, so, she got her egg, she got spam, she has two children now. And if, when Mr. Wright comes, she'll get married, she has her children already. So people are doing things differently. I think if you want your egg, you want that child to be your, yours, you wanna save those eggs earlier before age 45. And I, I might I add to that, another thing that people don't think about is, Patients who are being treated for cancer, freeze their eggs, freeze their sperm. I think it's tragic. I had a patient who came to see me because, you know, he said he and his partner were trying to get pregnant. It wasn't working. They've tried so long. And I tested his sperm, zero. So then I asked him, I said, well, what, what's going on? Tell me a little about your past. What, what happened to you? Oh, yes. When I was, you know, 17, 16, he had testicular cancer. And they were all concerned about 
um, you know, cancer treatment. So the first thing, they just went ahead and, and, and treated the cancer, but they did not focus on freezing his sperm. So now he is an adult and can no longer have children because they did not consider that part. They just didn't think about it. So freezing the eggs or freezing the sperm is, is, is a very good idea. Just hold things in stasis so that when the cancer is treated and gone and the person wants to get pregnant, there's no worries about that. I think we need to get uh, Dr. Famu Iwa. I hope that's, I said yes, the name, Famu Iwa. Correct. Yeah, we need to get you an uh, invitation into Clubhouse so you can tell, <laughs> you can tell all the young ones about this, but this is really important. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, this is the first time I'm hearing it. And if you say it's ethically fine, there's no line being crossed here. And if Dr. Ho, whom I trust with my whole heart, uh, echoes that, then, I guess we have to embrace that message and, and uh, pass it on. Thank yes. you so much, ma'am. Yes. yes. Thank you so much. And doc, um, Dr. Olawale Ajo, you have been waiting so patiently. Please proceed with asking your question. I've been trying to ask you to unmute. Great, it's unmuted. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, I, I'm not sure if I missed um, part of the... Um, the 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 um that uh, you know the speech, but I know you mentioned that one of at least two of the reasons you don't want to um, get pregnant too late is one, um, the um, the fertility is going to reduce the older you get, and then also the ability of the body to handle the strain will reduce. But well, what do you have to say about um you know um, some congenital um conditions that get worse with age, you know, like um, Down syndrome and some other um, conditions that have to do with the age of the um, mother or father. Is it the age of the person themselves or the age of the egg? So does that mean freezing the egg um, reduces those risks? Okay, can I just interrupt just a little quick, then I'll let you go back to your question, because you, I see you starting to blend certain things together that don't go together. Uh, first off, Down syndrome, I don't know that necessarily gets worse with age. Um, I think we all know several Down syndrome people that have been able to live a nice, healthy life and cope. So well, Down syndrome doesn't get... No, I don't mean, I don't mean the, the mother having Down syndrome. I mean, all the older mothers more likely to give birth to a baby with Down syndrome? So, so what happens is um, both the mother and the sperm, um, certainly more in the mother, what you're thinking about is what is called an aneuploid. I simplify it to my patients by saying a genetic accident. When the egg and the sperm meet in the process of fertilization, the egg and the sperm align the DNA together, right? So, so that chromosome one should align with chromosome two and chromosome three should align with chromosome three. Um, they are held together in the mid portion of the nucleus by microtubules that are tethered at the poles of the, of the nuclei, okay? The tethering mechanism and the microtubules start to fracture with age. So the most important factor in aneuploid is actually the female egg. So, so when you fertilize and the mechanism holding up the DNA of the egg is fracturing, all of a sudden you have a staggering and the mismatch and you, you pump out a genetically abnormal baby, I call that a genetic accident. The vast majority of which actually cannot even survive, right? They don't go beyond um, several weeks of, of gestation. You might not even know you were pregnant. Uh, a lot of them will, will abort. Vast majority of chromosome uh, 20, trisomy 21, which is Down syndrome. What you don't know is the vast majority of that actually also spontaneously aborts actually. Very few make it. The incidence of aneuploidy is the medical term increases with a woman's age. You're going to go from a range of about 20% aneuploidy rate in your early 30s to by the time you're over 40, 80% aneuploid rate. So when people come to see me, 
and they want to do IVF, for instance, and they're like 43, 44, I always tell them, you might want to consider doing genetic studies because it's not unusual to find a lot of these women have all abnormal embryos, right? And if we didn't test, the embryos look normal, we put them back and they'll go, doc, why didn't I get pregnant? Don't ask me, we, we didn't check. So when you, as you get older, the incidence of adenoploidy escalates. That's why it's crucial to freeze your eggs early and try to freeze mature eggs in order to you to for you to assure one normal baby whenever you want. When you're in your early 30s, you might need to have 15 to 20 mature eggs. Now, when you're now freezing at age 39, 40, instead of having just 15 to 20 eggs, you might need to freeze up to 30 eggs before you can assure that you will actually have a normal. So the incidence escalates with the, the most critical factor in success is related to the age of the egg. Okay. Honestly. That is why if you freeze your eggs when you're say 33, 34, and then you want to get pregnant in 41, 42, you're more likely to get pregnant with the eggs from when you were 32 or 33. So the, that brings me to uh, the next question. Um, you mentioned that the eggs should be mature. That means we're not necessarily trying to get the eggs as soon as the, the baby is born, as long as the person is born. No. We we'll wait until maybe there's, a, there's, a, there's, well, a, there's well, an well, optimal well, range, like correct. 20, no, no, no. 25, Again, 30. Don't yeah. conflate two things. When I refer to maturity, I'm not referring to the age of the person. Yeah, I understand that. Your eggs are all frozen in a state of meiotic division. They're frozen. Boom. Like, you know, when you play musical chairs, they're all frozen in the same stage. They complete the process of maturation upon fertilization. Oh, now, I see what you're saying. Yes. So it's actually at the developmental stage of the egg, right? So when I refer to maturity of the egg, when we stimulate someone to collect eggs, you are going to have a mixture of extremely mm -hmm. immature eggs referring gotcha. to the developmental stage. That's called the geminal vesicle. Can't really do much with that. Then you have the M1 phase and a fully mature M2 um, egg that is easier to fertilize and have more success. So when you stimulate to get a crop of eggs, you know, it's great. I mean, a lot of times I do get all mature eggs, but you're going to get a mixture, right? So when you're thinking of preserving your fertility, you don't freeze geminal vesicles and think you have frozen egg stores. You do not. You will get a rude shock when you decide to use them later. You wanna focus on how many mature eggs do you have? And that is why for a lot of women who are freezing their eggs, we have set our egg freezing price to really as low as rock bottom possible so that some of these patients choose to go through one, two, sometimes three rounds till they have a lot of mature eggs. Then they can, and then the ones that don't have, if you come to me and you tell me you want to freeze your eggs at 41, 42, I'll be like, hmm, we can freeze them. I don't know how useful they will be, right? And certainly, you know, trying to freeze your eggs at 43, 44, I'll just tell you, I don't think so. So one last question. I understand yeah. that a frozen egg, let's say you freeze your eggs at 30, that, that egg will perform better than when the eggs that you have when you're like 40. Absolutely. But when you're 40, those frozen eggs, how do they compare with the 30 year old version? Like storage, is it a perfect? Fine. It's so, absolutely so, exactly the same. There's no so, down. So here's sides. the key. Yeah. You have to know where you're going to go freeze your eggs. I happen to be blessed with a wonderful embryologist that trained in China where she was in a, a center where they did 4,000 cycles a year. She knows this process. Like if you wake her up at 2 a.m., she'll jump out spitting out the protocol. She is like my mini magician in the lab. Not a lot of people are that skilled. You have to have the proper equipment. You have to invest in it. So one of the things I do is I, I actually invest in a lot of up-to-date equipment. You know, the reason everybody, every Tom, Dick, and Harry is not doing it is 
to get the bare minimum in the lab is almost half a million dollars. You have to be willing to put in the money for it. So then have the adequate trained personnel that knows what they're doing. So in our hands, we have excellent freezing and survival of the eggs. It's one thing to freeze the eggs. It's another thing for the eggs to survive the thaw process. In our hands, over 90% of the eggs that are thawed, thaw very well, right? So, and then sometimes we also look at how was it frozen? If you tell me your eggs was, you know, we look at the protocol, what protocol did they use? Because if you want to ship your eggs in, I may tell you, I'm not so sure about the lab you went to, you know, I, I, I can't really vouch for it. So you have to know the lab you're going into, know the background of who's doing the actual work. Um, you can read the bio of my embryologist, Dr. Lou, who I call her my magician. I, I'm just so blessed to have her in my practice. But she is the wonder woman that does makes all this magic happen. I think it's such a beautiful conversation and so wonderful. I have enjoyed throughout this evening, Dr. Femi Yuwa, just listening to you and the depth of your molecular biology uh, expertise. I'm a gene expression, uh, experimental pathology, um, cancer discipline person. And we have to know the same things we do a lot with apoptotic cell death and the genetics from start to finish, and you yourself are an exceptional expert. So I know that Dr. Liu and you are just a dynamic team, and we are just excited to have you share with us in depth how we can do those, answer those questions. Uh, Dr. Ajo, if you have questions in the end, you can come circle back. We want to give um, those who've been waiting and some questions in the chat to make sure we have them. Someone asked, what happens if a person dies and she, he or she has frozen eggs or sperm? Okay, so now we're getting to the realm of ethics. Before you cryopreserve your gametes, meaning your eggs or your sperm, you have to sign and notarize for us what you want us to do in the event that you, you, you pass away. What do we do? Does it go to your partner? Does it go to, you know, um, do you want to donate to people who are less fortunate? Um, that is a decision that I do not, re I refuse to make for patients. You have to make that choice before we get started. Because if you don't, then we won't accept it. Sim simple as that. That is absolutely wonderful. Another um, uh, participant asked, will a woman about 29 years old with irregular periods have problems getting pregnant? So the key issue is why is she having the irregular cycles? Is the irregular cycles because she's having premature failure of her ovaries, which we haven't discussed? Or is it because she has polycystic ovary syndrome, which we've talked on a little, or because she has a thyroid disorder that is affecting her ovaries. So the first thing is, why is she having the irregular cycles? I have a philosophy that I do, that I practice in my, with my patients. I refuse to jump to treatment until I have completed a thorough workup. I firmly believe in that. You know, people are eager, oh, I wanna get started, I wanna do this. No, because if you jump the gun, if whatever you do does not work, then you'll circle back and you'll start wondering, well, what did I miss? You need to have a thorough evaluation first by somebody who knows what they're doing to figure out what the underlying problem is. All right. I hope that answers that question. Absolutely. So another person asked, um, and we've, you've answered the question that 40 is, is the sweet spot, ha, is the latest. 30-ish is the sweet spot for freezing yes. eggs. And 40 is the latest. Someone asked early, the question. Early 30s is the sweet spot. Yes, early 30s, not 40s. And that 40, you're already in reduction, <laughs> trouble, and at risk. So yes. someone asked the question, have you seen women over 50 be effective at saving their eggs? No, ma'am. I can ask you, I, mean, I don't even go there. I, I refuse to even get into that because I, I have women coming to me, well, my aunt Berta and, you know, my grandma, uh, no, no. 
It's too late. Wonderful, wonderful. Another participant asked, how do you treat uh, gynecomastia in a teenage boy? Okay, so again, um, gynecomastia, why? Goes back to my philosophy again, why? In case you don't, for people who don't know, yes. gynecomastia is when a, a, a male starts to have breast buds. Typically, it's either, there, there's got to be something producing estrogen, right? Do what is, you have to have evaluation. Why? Thorough history, thorough physical, get to the root cause before you figure out how to treat. You can't treat it if you don't know why. Wonderful. So there is another question. Uh, give me just a moment here to roll up and ask. Um, the question, does Clomid help with conception if you have irregular periods? Okay, so um, again, I don't like to treat until I've worked up a patient, but what Clomid does is if somebody is not ovulating, what Clomid does is Clomid tricks the brain so Clomid makes the ovary produce, you, you cut the, 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 um, the, the circuit going to the brain. So you have the brain produces FSH that stimulates the ovary to ovulate, okay? With Clomid, you trick the brain into producing more FSH so that the ovary responds by producing more estrogen that will now make your, your um, follicle, you have more follicular growth. So Clomid kind of tricks the body so you can ovulate better. However, I really don't believe that people should go take Clomid without being monitored. If you are going to take Clomid, it, the response to the medication has to be monitored. You can't just take it off the cuff. You have to monitor the response. Are you ovulating appropriately in response to Clomid? Or instead, are you ovulating with you know, five or six follicles as opposed to one or two? In which case you run the risk of having multiple deaths. So it has to be monitored versus just taking it. I know a lot of people just take it without any monitoring. You have to monitor your response to Clomid. If you over-respond, then you don't do anything that cycle. If you under-respond, then you increase the dose of the Clomid. Wonderful. A gentleman asked, how early should a man freeze their sperm? Well, you know, I think that if you have a, a male that let's say somebody in their 60s or 70s, you are going to have abnormal DNA in your sperm. So, you know, it's going to be very difficult to have normal. You're gonna have the incident of abnormal spermiation. You're gonna have um, um, DNA fragmentation in older sperm. So those are the things you have to, to, to look out for. Wonderful. And we have had a hand raised by uh, Adekodu. Can you uh, unmute yourself? I've been trying to unmute you. Thank you. I was going to say, can you please? Yes. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, my question is, uh, is PCOS um, hereditary? Because when I was um, younger, I... I went through it. I was treated um, before I was able to, um, to be fatal. Now, my daughter is going through the same thing. It's actually started the same age mine started when I was her age. So is it hereditary? So the thing with PCO is it also has to do with the environment. Different things can cause it. It's not necessarily hereditary, but you have to look at things like um, your diet, um, insulin resistance, diabetes. Those are partially 
genetic, partially environmental, right? So you have to look at, we, we talked a little bit about the environment in which your gametes are growing in. So you have to, you know, do, if you are insulin resistant, if you have a lot of insulin floating around in your body, it's going to affect your ability to, to ovulate. So part of it is also the environment, nurture, you know, genes, nurture. I think it all works in the same. So for instance, I mean, I think there's a higher incidence of PCO nowadays, but then you look at there's a high, higher incidence of obesity in the general population. Obesity, we know, is intimately tied to polycystic ovary syndrome. So you have to look at the environment as well. Thank you. Um, and someone else asked in the chat, can you please address the effects of STDs on fertility? Absolutely. Um, with, with STDs, one of the most common one is chlamydia, for instance. When you have an STD, you, you get an inflammation, an infection, a raging infection in the pelvic structures. So for instance, uh, patients will get blocked fallopian tube um, from, um, it, from, from the chlamydia or gonorrhea. So infection affects um, the fallopian tube. It may be obstructed. Um, so it, it, it causes side effects. Um, if you have chlamydia, gonorrhea, um, can cause inflammation, can lead to ectopic gestation. Um, so all those things have a consequence, right? So, and the bad one is chlamydia because chlamydia, you, people get an infection and they, their body produces an inflammatory response to it that may actually present itself at a later age. So yeah, STDs are bad. So if I may interject. Absolutely, go right ahead, Dr. O. So um, it's very important to bring this back to routine health maintenance. See your primary care doctor, yes. do STD testing. If you are having sex, test. You know, I say it all the time, you know yourself, you don't know your partner. You don't know how many people they've been with. And with gonorrhea and chlamydia, a lot of people don't even have symptoms. They don't know they have it. There is no discharge. If you have discharge that is abnormal, you run to the doctor to say, hey, there's something wrong here. You may not have any symptoms. So Correct. testing every now and then is important because treating early actually prevents issues. When these things are not treated early, that is when you know you then have the complications that can happen along the line and cause that blockage of the tube. That tube that is called fallopian tube is the tube that the egg goes through after it is fertilized that it has to you know travel through to go where it's supposed to go, you know. And if it, if it's blocked, then it's blocked. And that, Incidentally, that, I'll add to that. We now have evidence that patients who have men who have infections, it does cause decreased sperm parameters. Mm -hmm. HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, you will see abnormal semen analysis. So sometimes if you get a semen analysis that is bad, look for other things as well. Incidentally, we now know conclusively that the coronavirus can cause abnormal semen parameters. They're not transmitted in sperm, but they can affect your sperm because they cause an inflammation, an archaeitis, where the sperm is produced and stored that decreases the sperm parameters, meaning the numbers, the motility, the shape, the vitality of it, Infection overall is also bad news for your sperm. 
Wonderful. And and I have a, a question that I want or a statement that I want to make and have you address with regard to STDs. When I was very young in pu puberty, having all of these reproductive problems and was not sexually active, my doctor um, let me know that I could get chlamydia from bath towels. So I became in the habit of like, I changed bath towels. So I want you to address some of these. So, old no, things. no, 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 no. I think Dr. O answered that for you. No, no, can't happen. And not, yeah. you can't get it even from the toilet seat. The only yeah. thing I would caution people on. You cannot. Please, no douching. The body has a seat, an effluent. Anything your genital <laughs> tract flows out. Women who douche is linked to the incidence of pelvic inflammatory disease. That's when you flush bacteria up the tube. No douching. Your body will take care of it. Just regular hygiene. Clean yourself. No douching. Yeah. Wipe backwards. Don't get bacteria into your vaginal cavity and you should be fine. But off the toilet, I don't think so. No, no, no not, not, off no, no, not, not, not off the toilet. Not off the toilet. Not off the toilet. Not, you cannot get sexually transmitted disease. From, STD, a towel. from towels, from toilet, from uh uh. The only one I want to address is chlamydia because I'm telling you, I have at least 15 OBGYNs who have warned me to wear certain underwear, watch towels, watch anything that could disrupt. So I'm happy to have you update. I'm an old girl now, but it's something for young people to know because it's a lot in the literature, a lot. Okay, you cannot get chlamydia from towels. Mm -hmm. It's not possible. Mm -hmm. Chlamydia, gonorrhea are sexually transmitted diseases. Wonderful. You get Thank it, you. And, and you can get it. You're muted, Dr. O. You're muted. Oh, we can't hear you. You're muted. I'm sorry. I said you cannot get chlamydia or gonorrhea from towels. Yes. You can, though, get chlamydia, gonorrhea from oral sex. I have diagnosed oh, gonorrhea wow. in the throat. Yes. I've diagnosed gonorrhea in the throat. And so um, this begs another question. Some people <laughs> would decide to, women would decide to have sex with women because they, they say, you know, they don't get sexually transmitted disease wrong. I have seen HIV, hepatitis, BC, gonorrhea, chlamydia transmitted from women from woman to woman. So Thank these you. are also transmitted diseases. Thank you. It's so important like to, to burst myths. That's why I asked it because when I, I was a teenager, I was so religious about towels and my aunts, no one understood. And then I found out it was not true. So thank you. The insurance. I should tell you this one. I diagnosed a lady who had chlamydia, and yes. she told me she said, "Oh no, it's not from her husband. That is from the toilet seat. That also, <laughs> she, doesn't, she doesn't wipe the toilet seat. She's been told that she should wipe the toilet seat in public before she sits on it, and that was why. And you know what? It took me at least thirty minutes to get through to her that." I'm not saying your husband gave it to you. I said, you got this through sex. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't matter like how it. you say it. it happens. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's beautiful. So I have what I hope is a simple question. Um, Dr. Femi Yuwa, there were questions about um, people in the chat saying how impressed they were that you made the investment, right? In all of the technology to have leading edge state-of-the-art technology. Does insurance cover free so don't have it. You might Does insurance cover kindly mute? I did. I thank you. I got it. Um, does insurance cover freezing eggs and does it cover freezing sperm? So it kind of depends on what insurance you have. Uh, some policies will, a lot will not. I always tell patients, know your policy. When it says covers fertility treatment, you actually want to go into the fine detail. What do they mean by that? All right. And if you want, you can call our office. We can give you the codes. You have to know the fertility treatment codes to see if it's actually covered. Because they may say, well, we'll cover um, 
Um, we'll cover thawing of the uh, eggs, but we won't cover the freezing part. Or we'll cover uh, the treatment, but we won't provide medication. Know your policy. Now, there are certain states in the US that are so-called mandated states. Maryland happens to be one of them. Virginia is not, DC is not. Where it is mandatory if you have an employer who has employees over 50 in number, they have to cover fertility coverage. Therefore, when the Affordable Care Act came into being, because Maryland is a mandated state, if you get your insurance within the exchange, now not all the insurance in the exchange covers, but I know the Blue Cross Blue Shield products will, you will be covered. But within that, you have to know the specifics. So don't, a lot of people have no idea what the insurance covers. Now, for people who work with small corporations, you know, and decide to invest, you can actually make sure that when you're buying your insurance contract, you stipulate that I want to have this in there. Another uh, company that's coming up that I encourage if you, if you have a small business, um, uh, there's a fertility insurance company called Carrot Fertility. They provide insurance coverage for everything, everything. And they work with employee, employers. So if you have a corporation that hasn't decided, they don't know what to do, Carrot Fertility is a good place to start. Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, at least in the state of Maryland, covers is another good place to start. You have to know what's in there. So read the fine print is important. Correct. So another um, participant asked, how expensive, what range should a person budget for if their insurance doesn't carry it? Yes. So again, it depends on where you go. We have a flat rate of 7,700. It does not cover the workup though, because the workup is a whole different ballgame. You got to do the workup. It doesn't provide medication because we don't control the prices of that. And it does not cover if you want to freeze and keep it. Okay. It depends on where you go. I hear anywhere from the price I gave you all the way up to 12,000. You know, you, you got to look around. Um, and certainly, you know, someone told me, oh yeah, uh, you know, your prices are more expensive than it is in India, right? Yep, because my rent is more expensive than what I would pay if I were working in India, right? So you have to know your environment, do your homework, but be careful, be careful. Don't fixate on price. Because I, I have patients who call me all the time in duress. You know, go investigate, see if you get along with the people, see if you like the staff. Do you like their philosophy? Do you like the way they practice? You know, because you're going to be with them for a few months while you're going through this. So don't fixate so much on the money. Fixate on how good they are and how well you get along with them. And if you like them, right? Those are the things that I would say. But because I, I get, in a good day, I get two, three people who tell me, oh, we've had, you know, we, we left this other practice because, you know, we didn't get along. You know, you, you have to get along, you know, with, with your doctor. I mean, I'm not saying you're going to get along with me. I hope you do, but you don't, you, you're not going to get along with every single person. Go do your homework. See if you get along. Do you like them? What is their philosophy? Why are they practicing? You know, what is their, what is the method? What, what are they, you know, what is their passion? How do they do it? Who's in their lab? You know, and some, you can get all this from our website. Some websites will also give you the same information. So do your homework, but don't necessarily fixate on the money too much. So I have a couple of rapid fire questions um, that I want to ask, and I call them rapid fire because I think you can answer them quickly. Um, does testicular torsion in a teenage boy affect their reproduction in the future? Potentially. Needs to be evaluated right away. Needs to be treated right away. Beautiful. Um, can you please address the issue of ectopic pregnancies um, and address the issues of pelvic inflammatory disease? Ha, that is not rapid fire. I know it can't be. So, if we <laughs> so what is an ectopic pregnancy? When the egg comes out of the ovary, it gets picked up by the fallopian tube. They're hair-like structure that sweep over the ovary that pick it up. 
In the tube, the sperm swims up and fertilizes the egg in the tube. Then the fallopian tube has hair-like structure called cilia. They beat like a carpet, like a moving escalator that now takes the fertilized embryo is what we call it at this point. A fertilized egg becomes an embryo and it starts to divide. And by the time it reaches the, it, it is moved to the uterus. It takes about five days. And then when it gets to the uterus, it has to have a conducive environment in order for it to implant. Otherwise it won't implant and you'll never even know you were pregnant. Now that then says, what is an ectopic pregnancy? Ectopic pregnancy is any pregnancy that does not occur inside the uterus. Where could it be? Well, if your fallopian tube is damaged, like the one I'm showing you, it's swollen, it's damaged. The cilia, the carpet mechanism is no longer working. So if an egg gets in there, it'll get fertilized all right, but it's, it can't move to the uterus. So then the baby thinks it's in the uterus and it'll start to develop at the rate at which it should. And it starts to get bigger and bigger. Well, lo and behold, the tube is not meant for a baby. So you get to a certain critical size in which the uterus just ruptures and, and hemorrhages. And that becomes We can't hear you. Unmute yourself. Sorry, I hit it. By no, answer. it was not you. Someone else came in and was about to disrupt you. And that's why. Ah. Okay, so, so if it happens in the tube, it's not meant there. The tube will blow up. Now, if people have had damage to their tubes from either infection, from prior surgery, uh, any damage to the tube, a previous ectopic pregnancy, a previous tubal ligation that was corrected, right? Those hamper the function of the, the tube and the tube cannot do its job. Another topic that could actually happen is if, if the a, a, um, pregnancy actually falls out the tube, you get an abdominal pregnancy. Again, life-threatening, it's not meant to be there. Baby's gonna hemorrhage, the woman will hemorrhage to death, has to be correctly, accurately diagnosed and treated as soon as possible. The third form of ectopic pregnancy could be ectopic pregnancy that occurs, for instance, in the cervix. It's not meant to be there. The cervix is not gonna grow large, it'll blow up ectopic pregnancy that we're seeing nowadays in the previous, the scar of a previous cesarean section. So when the uterus is repaired, but it's not repaired properly, it forms a little tent, a little defect somewhere in the uterus so that if the pregnancy lodges in there, it's a defect. So when it starts to grow, that can also explode and hemorrhage. Again, has to be properly diagnosed right away Treat it as soon as possible. So again, definition of an ectopic pregnancy, pregnancy that does not occur within the uterus. You're muted. Dr. Jones. Thank you, so, thank you so much. Is there a time that a woman should stop having a pap smear? Should stop? Yes. Well, well, let's see. If you are no longer sexually active and you've had repeated pap smears that have been completely negative all along? If you cannot answer that question, I don't think there you should stop. Okay, thank you. There's another question. Could you please go back to explain menarche with respect to developmental height of children and how can we as parents ask for it to be altered as you suggested? Okay, so menarche is the process by which um, your menstrual cycle kickstarts, where your brain, we call it the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis, wakes up through predetermined whatever it is that, that, that triggers it to happen. It's set to happen typically in your early teens, 12, 13 year olds, right? But when you start to um, become uh, when your menstrual, when your HPO axis is activated too early, then you start to produce estradiol. Estradiol is the, is the hormone made by the follicles as they grow and ovulate. The same estradiol um, is, it can 
latch to estrogen receptors in the bo bone growth plate, right? Talk to your pediatrician. The way children grow is you have a part of your cartilage, the part of your long bones that grow through uh, remodeling and growing. And there's a plate there that if you produce too much estradiol, that plate accelerates and then becomes locked. So then you don't grow beyond that phase. So that's something you need to discuss with your pediatrician because all you have to do is halt the process. You can halt the process, halt the development of the follicles by a hormone called GnRH or Lupron and that suspends it. And then when the child is at the appropriate height or whatever, you can stop giving the medication and they can continue to grow. But that's a discussion you need, you need to have with your pediatrician. And there's another question. Would you recommend a tubal ligation reversal? What risk does it pose to women trying to get pregnant again? So um, again, it depends on A, how was it done? Were your tubes burnt or were they simply cut? In which case you can just simply take out the defective portion and rejoin it. Very simple, easy to do, right? But if the tube was, was burnt in multiple places, chances are there's nothing to put back there. Now, another thing too is when you repair the tube, which I, I know how to do, it's very easy to do, um, then you have to wait for the natural process to occur, for the woman to ovulate, for the egg to get in the tube, for the sperm to get in the tube, fertilize the egg, the embryo to go to the uterus. That process takes time. So if you are 32, Fantastic, untie your tubes. If you're 42, I don't know that you have that extra time because guess what's gonna happen? By the time you figure out that, oh yeah, I think my tubal reversal is working, you may run out of eggs to discuss that issue. So for someone who's older, you're, you're, you're better off just going to IVF and just leave that tube alone. Wonderful. There was another question that asked about um, the matter of sleep. Uh, Dr. O, this is directed at you. Dr. O talked about going to bed earlier than 12 or 2, 2 a.m. Can you please discuss, both of you, um, the issue of sleeping late? And the person says that they most often sleep four to five hours. Well, uh, go ahead. Yeah. I, I don't know if that person came in earlier in my presentation, but I actually had a slide that talked about sleep. Sleep is where your body repairs itself. You decrease inflammation with proper sleep. So again, you want your eggs and your sperm to be developing in an environment of decreased inflammation. So that's my take, and I'll let Dr. O take the rest. Well, sleep is important for the brain. We didn't know how the brain cleaned itself out yes. until not too long ago, about six years ago, we found out that the brain cleans itself out in sleep. It sounds like washing machine when you sleep all night long. Then the, the research also researched how many hours should you sleep that is beneficial. And they found that for everyone, it is different. So if four hours is what is good for you, then sleep four hours, but consistency makes a difference. They found out, the research for that found out. You have to be, consi you, you have to be consistent. If you go to bed at 10, and you wake up at one, keep it consistent. If you go to bed at 10 and wake up at six or seven, make it consistent. Consistency is important. And they found that, that if you're consistent in sleep, you would decrease the chances of dementia, memory issues. So when a naturopathic guru came on the forum, he talked to us about being predictable, somewhat predictable in our routines. Sleep, work, have the hours that you work, the hours that you wind down, the hours that you do this, be predictable. 
And I see that it has worked so well for me, even though I've been preaching this, I need it. So now preach it to me and, and take it and do it. So I have been doing my best to do that. Dr. O, me too. I have enjoyed um, being in the home for COVID because it's been increasing my sleep and sleep patterns, but I am becoming a loyal eight hours a night. Even if I'm up, I don't get out of the bed except to go for a comfort break because sleep is so important to the body. And I know it, and now I'm living it again. So thank you. Um, Dr. Femi, you are, there was another question um, that was asked earlier, and I'm gonna bring it back. One was when you talked about ectopic pregnancies, did you also talk about pelvic inflammatory disease? It's uh, pelvic inflammatory disease can cause infertility. Now, pelvic inflammatory disease is a whole different topic by itself, right? right? So that's why I say we don't want to conflate the issue. It's, it can cause anything that destroys the motion of the fallopian tube, that motion, that carpet-like movement, that escalator movement that I told you about will cause infert um, infertility, ectopic pregnancy. And PID is one of them. Thank you. What are some of the side effects of con contraceptives and contraceptive use on fertility? So again, people sometimes make the mistake to think, oh yeah, the reason I'm having issues with my eggs is because I was on birth control pills. I don't believe so. I think the birth control pills can hide, can delay you detecting what's going on. But when you take the birth control pills away, whatever is there will show. The birth control pills did not cause it, right? Whatever is on the ground there will show. Thank you. Can you please address the issue of precocity? P-R-O-C-O-C-I-T-Y. I, I think that's what we've been talking about all day today. When we say premature menarche, early starting of your menstrual cycle. So yeah, I think we've, we've talked at length about that. Wonderful. Um, another question is, what is the normal bus size range for teenage girls and the normal bus size? Yeah, what's the normal bus size? Well, I, I don't know that there's a normal bus size. I think it has to do with body habitus, right? What we look at when we look at breast development of, of girls is not so much how big or how little it is, but the shape the, you know, it, there are different stages of breast development that we look at. Whether that breast is small, large, whatever, that has to do with your body habitus, right? So if you're overweight, you might have a more fat tissue, right? So it has nothing to do with, with um, um, what size is standard. And, and this is genetics, what you inherit. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this is the last question. What do you, would you recommend for a TTC who has been diagnosed with endometriosis and uterine fibroids? A, a what? Say that again. A TTC, literally. Uh, Terry, if you're still on and you want to expound upon your question, um, but what would you recommend for a TTC who has been diagnosed with endometriosis and uterine fibroids? Can you tell me what you mean by TTC? I don't know. Terry, so. are you still on? It's a question in the chat. It's so, a question in the chat. Yeah. Terry, are you still on and are you able to unmute your mic? Just trying to conceive. Trying to conceive, TTC. Trying to conceive. Okay, thank you. So for a woman who's trying to conceive endometriosis and fibroids, what would you recommend? Well, so again, they be careful problems. of mixing things up. I think, I think we're conflating issues here. Um, so you have to look at, you know, how long have you been trying to get pregnant? You know, what's going on? Is somebody who has been trying for a year, for instance, is different from somebody who has been um, trying for a month. Um, if you're over the age of 35, we tell you that if you've tried for six months, that's, you know, long enough, you need to seek help. If you're younger than that, you know, over one year is more than enough, get help, but definitely don't wait too long. And sometimes people come to see me and they say, well, we've only just started um, trying to get pregnant. So, you know, what, what can we do? And then I'll say, well, well, let's look at, let, let's check, you know, 
let's do some preliminary investigation. Let's check the plumbing. Let's make sure the tubes are open. Let's check your hormones. Let's check your um, ovarian reserve. Um, so I, I would say, you know, let's do some homework first and then, you know, go from there. Okay, I think the question this person is asking is that this person has gone through certain screenings. The woman has endometriosis and uterine fibroids. What would be your advice? It depends on, you know, when you say uterine fibroids, how big, you know, are they? It depends on the size of the fibroids. Someone has um, fibroids that are not too big, that are not really distorting the cavity, then there's nothing to be worried about. But if they have large fibroids, um, how many fibroids are there? You know, if you have a large fibroid that can be easily removed and then the uterus behaves as regular, or do you have multiple fibroids that are presenting an issue? Or has the patient um, have their fibroids re removed more, on more than one occasion? So you have to look at, again, that, that probably goes into what I've talked about doing a complete and thorough workup first. And it depends on the positioning. That's very yes. important. The yeah. Because you can exactly. have fibroids um, if it's not in an area that would- That's bothersome, it, yes. It doesn't matter. Yes. So, uh, yeah, those are difficult questions. Yeah. And I, you have to be. Thank you. And I want to um, tell everyone that I have placed, Dr. O has placed repeatedly uh, Dr. Femi Uwa's, uh contact information. She is available for care. You're still taking patients, right? Yes, I am. And so to follow up with care, there were two other quick, not quick, but questions that were placed in the chat box. And before you leave, I want to make sure. Um, someone asked, what are the causes of menstrual seizures? Menstrual seizures. What, I, I again, that. I don't think that that's a medical term. What, define what you mean by medical. So, can term. the person who asked the question? I don't want to butcher your name. I, um, I know, I know who. Papa, yes. Papa Arogun Dadisa. Yes. Um, I'm unmuting you, sir, to ask your mm -hmm. question. Yes, sir. Can you ask your question, sir? Good evening, sir. Okay, can you please, I think that you've talked about this next question. Dr. Ajagwe asked the question, can you please say something about the stress due to uh, desperation to get pregnant? And the uh, um, pseudocyces? Pseudocyces is just when somebody thinks that they're pregnant, but they're actually not. And, and sometimes that, that can have a wide variety of causes. I don't think this is a forum to discuss that because a lot of it also can be psychological. So, you know, that's what, the, that's what I'll, I'll say about that. Stress of pregnancy, it's extremely real. Um, I always tell my patients, find something that relaxes you while you're going through your stress journey. Um, certainly it's very helpful when you have a team approach. Again, I emphasize teamwork. When you have both partners in the game together, it, it's extremely help, helpful. So some people have very bad anxiety, um, they can actually be treated with uh, anti, anti azeolytic medications. Um, but if it's not that critical, I always tell patients to find something that you find to be de decreasing, de that, that decreases stress. Um, I am a nature person. I like to be outdoors. I like to be with trees. Um, find something that helps you relax. Um, certainly being more relaxed is, is helpful. Um, sometimes the problem can be with family stress. You know, um, everybody in the family say, hey, what's going on? You know, what are you guys doing? When are you getting to it? So I always tell patients, keep it to yourself, keep it to your partners um, and, and find whatever you can do to decrease your stress level. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Femi, you, are, you have been amazing and excellent. The chat box has been li lighting up with people saying thank you for your brilliance. I want to personally thank you again for your excellence and for your brilliance. Two people dropped two more questions in. One is the best management for uterine fibroids. And the other is um, what effect does tubal ligation have on a woman? 
um, on the health of a woman, generally as a woman ages with correlation to their bone health and any other issues you can point out. So I don't necessarily think that a, a tubal ligation affects anything, um, you know, because it's a different structure. You're talking about what's going on in the egg versus what's going on in the fallopian tube, a little bit separate, uh, doesn't really af affect anything. Um, what was the other part of the question again? Um, that was about the fallopian tubes. And then someone else asked about what would you uh, recommend for the management of uterine fibroids? Again, uterine fibroids depends on how big, like Dr. O states, some of them are really not that big. Leave it alone, leave it alone. If it's big enough, then I would say you can remove it. And if you're going to remove it, do so surgically. Um, one of the things that I don't really, I'm not a good fan of is if people go get an embolization, uterine artery embolization, it yeah. cuts off blood supply to the fibroids. Guess what it also cuts off blood supply to? It cuts off blood supply to the lining of that uterus. So then implantation becomes a challenge. Another one is high frequency ultrasound. Again, what does that do? It takes ultrasound from different angles and they meet at a confluent spot to you know, basically burn the fibroid and, and decrease the size. Well, again, that also affects the integrity of the uterus. So if you're not trying to get pregnant, you can really do anything you want to the fibroid. It's when you're trying to get pregnant that you have to be careful with what you do to it. Um, you know, a clean cut if you're going to remove a fibroid clean cut so there's less scarring, there's less peripheral damage to the uterus is probably better. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask all of our participants to unmute your mic and please give a round of applause and a thank you to Dr. Yimi Famuyewa. She has been a UWA. She has been thank amazing you. and awesome. Thank you. And we thank appreciate you so, you so much. Thank, thank, you. thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. I'm blessed. Your you. talent thank and your treasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm humbled. Um, thank you. My uh, question is still uh, unanswered. What causes uh, menstrual uh, sudden sudden stoppage of menstruation when one is still young? What What do you mean? Do you oh. mean okay. the cessation? I, where I get that it. is what I mean by seizure. Oh, cessation. Um, sudden. Stop. Stop. Sudden stoppage of uh, Stop. menstruation. Stop. At, uh -huh. at, at, not at, at old an, age, but at a young age. At an old age. Okay, I'm so sorry, sir. I didn't understand. Um, at an early age, you're probably referring to what we call premature ovarian failure. It's a, as a result of them running out of eggs at a very early age in an unusual fashion. So when you're not cycling, you don't have any hormone priming the lining and definitely nothing shedding that lining. The lining for it to shed first has to be primed with estrogen. Then it's shed when you take away progesterone, which I can cause artificially just by playing around with hormones. But if you want it done naturally, the ovary is responsible for that based on the hormonal uh, release coming from the growing follicle. And as it's ovulated, when it dies off, it starts to make mostly progesterone after ovulation till it finally dies off. So when that cycle is interrupted abruptly, patients go into premature ovarian failure. That is a real problem because I'm seeing that in a lot of my patients. They just simply run out of eggs at a very early age. There are different theories about that. A, is it autoimmune? Is their body producing antibodies or chemicals that is attacking the eggs that they have? B, is it um, because, um, is it genetic? We know that certain women, for instance, Turner syndrome, who have genetic abnormalities, tend to go into premature uh, failure at a much rapid age. So when that happens, it needs to be completely worked up to see what is the root cause. Do they have uh, a genetic uh, syndrome? Most of them do not. And the answer is, we honestly really don't know why what, what triggers this problem and makes them go through all their eggs. And it cannot be reversed, okay? It cannot be reversed. Um, so yeah, it, it's a problem. 
Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Thank we appreciate you. you. Oh. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for getting through because we were trying to call on you and couldn't get you. So thank you so much for persisting. So tonight brings us to the close of our evening. We're gonna close in the fashion that we always do so that you leave this call lifted. But before we do, I want to hear uh, closing remarks from Dr. Femi Yuwa, and then I'd like to hear from Dr. O, and then we will leave tonight lifted and feeling spirited and being reminded that joy is so important to our lives. Dr. Femi Yuwa? First up, I, I really just want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to come before you. I am completely humbled. Um, this has been a wonderful audience. You've asked engaging questions. This is really fantastic. These are the questions that people need to be asking. And I'm glad that we have the forum to bring it up because a lot of people are simply not aware. So by sharing this, we can spread the word. People are asking fantastic questions. Questions that, wow, you know, I'm just so impressed with this audience. And I, I just, I thank you um, for giving me the permission to come before you. I am truly humbled. You've been a wonderful audience and I look forward to more of this. And I wish you all the very best and get the word out there because the more we know, the more we can do. And I think part of the problem, Dr. O and I have talked about this. Uh, the frustration on my part is that the message about fertility is simply not getting out there. And I tend to see patients when it's almost too late. So I'm so proud of Dr. O to be at the forefront of trying to be, because a lot of primary care physicians don't talk about it. They're so busy, they don't mention it. So a lot of women don't know they're running out of chances. So I'm so excited that she's doing this. And I, I hope that the rest of us can take this message and go out there and spread the word. Thank you so much. Absolutely awesome. And you can believe that we will be spreading the message. We will be following up. There's so much waiting, Dr. O, to get out into social media. We're going to grow this audience. And yes. that's what we're going to spend the next 90 days doing. And so, Dr. O, please. Thank you so much again. Amazing, amazing, amazing information. Knowledge is power. And thank you, Dr. Famuiwa, for coming. Um, especially you, a woman of color, in this, you know, in your field. With, you know, we, tonight is not the night to talk about, you know, those things. They're not challenges; they're opportunities. So we appreciate you. Yes, fertility is an important subject because it has to do with our well-being, even at any age. We can see how we took this back to children to see how we can fix things from that early age so that it doesn't become a potential problem later on. And next week, we're going to go back to routine health maintenance with an amazing physician, Dr. Bouvel. Get ready, sit tight for an amazing evening and to talk about all that has to do with eyes. So sister, my darling sister, Dr. Jennifer Jones, thank you again for all you do, for leading us, all right? For making sure that we stay in tune and in line. The job she does is not easy. She makes it look like mm, it's a piece of cake, but no. She's putting the timing, the who goes first, everything together. Thank you. God bless you. And yes. <laughs> God bless you as well. And there's someone who raised their hand. Jimmy, I'm going to give you just a moment uh, to ask your question since it's a burning one. Jimmy? Oh, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, um, Dr. O. Thanks, um, Dr. Jennifer Jones. Thanks, Dr. Famuiwa. Um, it's just an observation or a comment. Maybe I should take this offline. I was going to propose that we actually turn all these series into a mobile app. 
So thank you. Thank you for the recommendation. We welcome ideas and it is absolutely in the mix. But before we do anything, we want to make sure that we fight the good fight of getting Dr. O some broadcast time in national broadcast media. And so my first aim is to have this show be recognized in the national and international media. And then after that, we can increase access. But without getting her in the national and international media and getting her to the place where other people value this community effort and are willing to invest. So by national media, what I mean is the government resources, corporate sponsorship resources and other clinicians who want to and understand. So we, our first mission is to build the audience so that people know that in the name of our God, we can serve our community without yes. looking for response, looking for payment, looking for money, but from the pureness of our hearts. And then we're going to show how we can take this vital information and monetize it so that we can do more to help people have more missions, get the word out to young people, get Dr. Femi Yuwa connected with Dr. Sean Cheryl Cooper, who has 238,000 young people watching her on TikTok every day and how we can do those kinds of things. That's what we're gonna do first and then we'll be, but the technology we welcome as much as you have, please continue to share ideas. Amen. Amen. Amen to that. Just to say, Dr. Akinton Day has a P has PhD in mathematics. He, <laughs> all of those things that, oh, you're like, whoa. He has like three PhDs, and one of it is IT. It develops apps and programs and all of those things that I have no clue what they mean. <laughs> so thank you so much, because I get it. You're like, I want to, I want to sow into this ministry. Yes. yes. What you're saying. We get it and we revert back to you. Thank, yes. Thank you. So excited. Really excited. I just we have people talk. like that, like him. Yes. <laughs> yes Thank you. Thank you so much. So if all minds and hearts are clear, we're going to close our show the way yes. we always do. Good night, everybody. Thank you for another amazing show. Thank you for another amazing evening. Just thank, thank you, you all. Thank you, Dr. O. Thank you so much, Dr. Femi Yuwa. Thank you to all of our participants. We couldn't do this without you. Thank you to our quiet angel, Dr. Caprice. And I want to say happy birthday. I don't know if um, oh, Isabella is still on the call or not, but I'm still oh. going to shout her out and let her know that we are sending her birthday love. Thank you. Bella, wait, wait. <laughs> Bella, I see her. Yes. Hi, oh, camera, so we can say happy birthday. Oh. Thank yes. you. So much. you know, Naomi, uh, oh yes, yeah, celebrated her birthday. Um, and Bella was at the celebration, I do believe. Bella, put on your camera. Let us see your smiling face. Happy birthday. Bella, come on. Yes, there she is. Happy Thank birthday you. to you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you.